Let me open us in a word of prayer. Lord, thanks for this morning. We thank you for the words, it is finished, Lord Jesus, that you proclaimed on the cross. We thank you for an empty tomb on which your church is built. We thank you for the guarantee of eternal life to all who are in Christ. We thank you for the realities of the gospel which secure us. Uh, Nothing else could, and so we want to boast only in you, but we ask for your help to do that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is October, uh, which means it is Reformation Month, uh, if we can declare it so. And uh, this is a five-Sunday month. It it is fitting for us an equipping hour to look at the five slogans of the Reformation. Uh, Scripture alone, grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. As I came into the parking lot this morning, I noticed one license plate holder says, Soli Deo Gloria. Uh, That is an appropriate slogan for all of us uh, who hold to that no boasting clause of the gospel. That we come to God on the basis of His grace, by faith, in Christ, to His glory. And all of that tagged with this word alone. This morning, uh, we're looking at Solus Christus, or the Reformation slogan of in Christ alone. And really, this is shorthand for a a full-hearted belief in and only in the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. That is the only way that sinners may be reconciled to a holy God. And when Jesus hung on the cross and said, it is finished, he meant the work of salvation and redemption, the price paid for our rescue is complete. He is unlike the Old Testament sacrifices, which had to be offered again and again and again. He was unlike the Old Testament priests who offered those sacrifices over and over and over again. He was the once for all time sacrifice, which finished the reconciliation of sinful man to a holy God. Uh, When we say Christ alone, that is what we mean. Uh, In the context of the Reformation, uh, which we'll spend some time on this morning, uh, the, the slogan was not used to describe Jesus over and against all other religions. Jesus and not Buddha, Uh, Jesus and not the the Greek pantheon, Jesus and not the Norse deities. In in the context of the Reformation, where the the so-called Christian church was king over Europe, the slogan meant Christ alone over and against an idea of Jesus plus other forms of merit to make you right before God. And we'll come to our day and and think about this slogan and and perhaps some applications for our modern day. But in thinking in terms of the Reformation, in in the origin of this slogan, we must think in terms of the context of the 16th century. I want to begin uh, by reading the the wonderful poem by F.W. Pitt. It's titled, Maker of the Universe. He wrote, The Maker of the Universe... As man, for man, was made a curse. The claims of law which he had made, unto the uttermost he paid. His holy fingers made the bow that grew the thorns that crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hands were mined in secret places he designed. He made the forest whence there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood and yet made the hill on which it stood. The sky that darkened o'er his head, by him above the earth was spread. The sun that hid from him its face, by his decree was poised in space. The spear which spilled his precious blood was tempered in the fires of God. The grave in which his form was laid was hewn in rocks his hands had made. The throne on which he now appears was his from everlasting years. And a new glory crowns his brow, and every knee to him shall bow. When we think about what Christ did for us on the cross, we think no less 
than what the infinite God of the universe, the maker and sustainer of all things who took on flesh, did at the cross. He was no mere man dying a man's death. He, He was not offering something that mere mortals could offer. He offered himself in the infinity of his nature in order that he might absorb the infinity of the wrath of his Father against an immeasurable debt of sin perpetrated by us. And no one else could satisfy that wrath. Nothing but the infinite treasury of Christ's personal merit could satisfy God's anger against our sins. Any substitute for Christ is blasphemous and suicidal. Any addition to Christ is likewise blasphemous and eternally death-bringing. When we looked at the, the solas last week, we talked about the important word alone. And, and remember that Scripture plus something, Scripture plus the magisterium of the medieval period, destroys Scripture. Grace plus merit destroys grace. Christ plus anything or anyone else destroys Christ. Faith plus works destroys faith. And glory to God plus some glory for others who have a part in this thing destroys glory to God. In other words, the word alone is critical to this because it encapsulates the very idea of the uniqueness and exclusivity of the gospel. You don't have the gospel when you add to it. It's critical that uh, we uphold this doctrine of solus Christus or Christ alone. The issue of Christ alone is ultimately the a statement of the sufficiency of the once for all time work of Christ accomplished at the cross. Its relationship to the other solas are important. Uh, scripture points to the satisfactory work of Christ. Our grace Uh, Grace alone, which comes from God and the gospel, only comes to us through the shed blood of Christ. Our faith must be not faith in faith or faith as an idea or just positive vibes, but actual faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And according to Philippians 2, it is on the basis of his humiliation that Jesus will be exalted and receive glory. To him be the glory because he was the servant who suffered. These things all relate to the cross of Christ. I want you to turn in your Bibles to the Bible's testimony to sola, solus Christus, Christ alone. Turn to John 19 as we begin. In John 19.30, we have this definitive statement. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. What an audacity it would be to say, ah, Jesus, I don't think it was finished. I think I need to add some things to what you accomplished in order that I might be made right with God. Look at Philippians chapter 3. This is Paul's own testimony. Paul, previously Saul, was a Pharisee, a persecutor of the church, one who rejected Jesus as the Messiah until Jesus saved him. And then he writes these sobering words. Verse 1, to write the same things again is no trouble for me, and it safeguards you. Beware of the dogs, the evil workers, Beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and the glory, and we glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more, and listen to all the things Paul could put forward as human merit before God. Circumcised the eighth day. 
followed the rules from before he was able to, to even have a will to do so. S- uh, of the nation of Israel, the right pedigree, of the tribe of Benjamin, beloved nationally, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was top-notch in his uh, group of chosen people, according to the law of Pharisee, strict adherence to the rules, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. His was no empty religion. He felt it. It burned in his heart to the point that he acted on it. As to the righteousness found in the law, found blameless. Before men, who could accuse Paul of being a lawbreaker? And he says, verse 7, But whatever things were gained to me, these I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in him, listen to this, not having a righteousness of my own derived from law, but a righteousness that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained it or become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Do you hear how Paul contrasts any glory that could go to him or any merit that could come from him over and against all that is in Christ? They are diametrically opposed. You can't have some glory for Paul and glory to Christ. You can't have some merit from Paul and say, I need a righteousness not of my own, not derived from the law, but the righteousness of God. Where does the righteousness of God come from, according to Paul in Philippians 3? Only through faith and only in Christ Jesus. Paul was radically transformed from smuggling merit into his standing with God to completely eschewing all merit whatsoever. In one sense, the whole Bible is the declaration of Christ alone, for most of it anticipates, declares, or reflects on the cross work of Jesus Christ. This truth is simple, and it is deep. The answer is Jesus. The answer will always be Jesus. And yet we will never plumb the depths of the love of God for us in Christ. We will never understand the depths of the reality of our sins, that we never approximate the truth of how wretched we are in our nature and in our actions, and so we will never approximate the truth of the depth of the love of God for us. When we were at our worst, Christ died for us. When we think about the Reformation, again, we're not talking about the evolution of some new idea in the 1500s. We're talking about the return to the New Testament's truths And the Reformation was a return to Christ alone. And just by way of contrast, I want to set the context for us a little bit in placing ourselves in medieval history, placing ourselves at the time of the Reformation, and what were those things that that solus Christus was a slogan against? If if the Reformers were saying Christ alone, and the counter-reformation were saying, no, it's not Christ alone, it's Christ plus. What was in the plus column? It would be helpful for us to understand this just a little bit. The first thing that's added to, to Jesus in that system was the Roman Catholic priesthood. The reformers proclaimed the New Testament doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. As redeemed, we are priests unto God. That means we are living sacrifices. We have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. God dwells in us. Our bodies are the temple. Uh, the, The altar on which sacrifices are to be laid is the whole course of our life, Romans 12, 1 and 2. And yet the Roman Catholic Church went back to Old Testament pictures and terminologies to describe our relationship to God that had to be mediated through priests, through altars, through continual sacrifices and ceremonies. 
Think about that. Where, where, where do we get the idea of the, of the priest in the medieval period? That, that, that comes from Mosaic law. That's Old Testament terminology. That had been done away with by the rending of the curtain, opening the way by the blood of Jesus for direct access for believers to God with no mediation through a priesthood. And then it was demolished physically by God in A.D. 70 when he flattened the temple through a Roman general. It has never been rebuilt to this day. The priesthood is over. And yet in medieval churches, you had priests and you had altars and you had the the sacrifice made over and over and over again in the Catholic Mass. The Catholic Mass is not like our practice of communion. We practice communion as a memorial. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me, Jesus said. The Catholic Mass, on the other hand, was a re-sacrificing of Christ on the altar by the priest who, when he said his Latin phrase, the physical bread would be turned into, miraculously, the body of Christ, and the physical wine would miraculously be turned into the blood of Christ, Jesus had to be re-sacrificed for sins committed since the last time you took the Mass. That is a fundamentally different use of the symbols Jesus gave, and it opposes the Gospel. This idea of, the, of a priesthood offering sacrifices as mediation between us and God goes against the truth of the New Testament that says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So Christ the mediator plus some other mediator is a problem. And it's a problem that destroys the gospel. And it destroys something very precious to us as believers in Christ in terms of being a temple of the living God and having direct access to him. A second plus or addition to Christ alone in medieval Christianity was this whole idea of the, the transubstantiation, the, the, the communion we just talked about, the actual turning of the elements in communion into the body and blood of Christ. Listen to the Council of Trent in its 13th session, October 11th, 1551. If, if you remember the date of the Reformation, we're talking about October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther nailed 95 theses. The, the Reformation was unleashed and the Catholics conducted a counter-Reformation. The Council of Trent was their uh, convening of all of their experts that said, hey, let's take a look at this Protestant Reformation and let's nail down what we believe is actually true in contrast. And they define transubstantiation this way, that wonderful and singular conversion of the whole substance of the bread into the body and of the whole substance of the wine into the blood the species only of the bread and wine remaining, which conversion indeed the Catholic Church most aptly calls transubstantiation. And you know that this became the the, the significant point of contention between the Protestant reformers and the Catholic Church in every country that the Reformation went. It was over this issue that the Marian martyrs, those who were killed under Bloody Mary, this is the reason that they were put to death, burned in front of their families. Uh, in downtown London, you can still go see the spot uh, where some of these were, were killed. You, you can see the, the building that uh, Mary sat in and watched out the window while they burned to death, and it was over this issue. Does the bread become the body of Jesus? Does the wine become the blood of Jesus? The Council of Trent says it does, and if, it, if you don't have that, you don't have grace given. And the Protestants said, no, that that undermines the gospel. Jesus was a sacrifice once for all time, and the work is finished. He needs not be sacrificed again. Another addition to Christ alone is the position of the Pope. He, He was called the vicar of Christ or Christ on earth. He was called the head of the church. In his hands, the Catholic Church said, was the power to forgive sins and to withhold forgiveness of sins. He was Jesus' representative on the earth. This again goes against Paul's declaration in 1 Timothy 2.5. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. 
You have an addition to Christ in medieval Catholicism, the treasury of the saints. And the idea here is that Christians who lived exemplary lives before, who were forgiven of their sins by the death of Christ and, and, and did lots of extra works, uh, they did what the Catholic Church called works of charity, and that's the old English word for love. Uh, they did good works that were more than they needed to pay for their own temporal sins after they first were inducted into the church. The, the Catholic doctrine of justification was that Jesus paid for your sins at the entry point into Catholicism. That's justification. But then any sins after that had temporal punishments that would be meted out in this life or in purgatory. And you had to do good works to overcome all of your sins after becoming a Christian. And, and some Christians were so exemplary, were even called saints, never mind the fact that in the New Testament all Christians are saints, but some were so exemplary and called saints that they stored up an extra treasury of their merits. And those merits are available to us poor Christians who aren't saints who need a little extra to get along. And, and we might be able to tap into this treasury in this life and we'll probably need to tap into that treasury in the next life in purgatory to finally make our way to a right standing with God. This treasury of the saints was defended on verses like Hebrews 4.10, which says, For whoever enters God's rest also ceases from his labors. And the implication the Catholic Church drew is that uh, exemplary Christians labored in this life and they ceased laboring when they got to heaven. So it's the, it's the merits they did in this life that are this bank of, of treasury that we can tap into. Revelation 14, 13 says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord henceforth. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit. They rest from their labors and their deeds follow them. In other words, saints in this life did good deeds here, and when they die, they can't do any more. And so those go with them into heaven, into the vault available to Christians on this side who can tap in and get some of those merits. One more verse they have used is 1 Corinthians 3.8. He who plants and he who waters are equal, and each shall receive his wages according to his labor. Do you see there, Christians earn wages according to their labors, and some earn extra. And, and those extra are available. So, Christian, when you have been justified by Christ and, and get into the church, but then you sin after that, you need more than what Christ has. You need your own good works. And if those aren't enough, you need the good works of saints who have gone before who did extra. That Christ plus obviously destroys Christ alone. Listen to Ephesians 2, 7. In the ages to come, God would show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In Ephesians 3, 8, Paul says, To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. Who is infinitely rich? Uh, who has the, the merit enough for poor sinners like us? Not other poor sinners, but Christ alone. It is the riches of Christ that are dispensed, uh, not the riches of, of other people's merit. And of course, along with the merit of the saints is individual merit. Uh, this is the whole idea in Catholic theology that you must be working your way towards a right standing with God in this life. Baptism may remove from you the guilt of original sin, in their view, and uh, justification may uh, remove from you past sins, but anything else you accumulate after that must be dealt with by you. You have to work out your salvation, according to Catholic doctrine, in the sense of making up for your bad deeds. You must have grace conferred to you. We already looked last week, if, if grace is earned, it's no longer grace, it's what's owed. But in the Catholic view, it's a grace of God that you can now work out your crimes 
and make up for the bad things that you've done and get yourself to heaven. This is why a Catholic, a good Catholic, would never say, I know I'm going to heaven if I died today. They can't have assurance because the work is not finished. In fact, they would claim that it is arrogant to have assurance of your salvation. Eternal security is a, is a proud doctrine that Protestants hold. Of course, we hold to eternal security because we believe when Jesus said it is finished, he meant the work of redemption was done. There's nothing for us to add. But Catholics very clearly believe, no, you must add and you cannot claim it's done because you're not dead yet and you're always in process. This is why the, the language between a de forensic declaration of righteousness, we talked about last week, is different than the, the phrase making righteous. And we have to be careful in our language here. We, we talk about uh, Jesus making us righteous. Uh, I don't want to be too Catholic here. Um, we need to talk about Jesus, uh, Jesus, on the basis of Jesus' work, God declaring us righteous. He declares, Romans 4, 5, uh, the ungodly to be righteous on the basis of faith. Now, it is true that we are being made righteous in the process of sanctification. It is true that we will be absolutely and perfectly righteous in glorification. We will be made righteous. But when Catholics talk about being made righteous, they mean the process of salvation, whereby you're getting better and better and better by making your good works make up for your bad works. And as I said before, if you don't do enough of those, you need the treasury of the saints to make up for the gap or some other things. They include in this prayers to the saints. If you grew up Catholic, uh, maybe you wore the, the, the medallions or the amulets. Maybe you've had things in your house uh, celebrating various uh, church history heroes or, or the departed saints uh, who in Catholic doctrine make intercession for us. And technically a Catholic would say, we don't actually pray to Peter. Um, we're just asking Peter to pray for us. Uh, I think that distinction is without warrant. If you're talking to somebody who's dead, that is off limits in the Bible. <laughs> you're not to do that. That is strictly forbidden in Scripture. And, and yet the, the Catholic claim is that offering prayers to saints or speaking to saints to invoke their prayers on our behalf is meritorious. That, that lighting a candle for, uh, towards one of the saints is meritorious. It, it, it adds to your credit, and you need to keep adding to your credit. Years ago, Scott Demarest and I were in uh, a Tibetan Buddhist monastery. And in the halls of this mon monastery, they, they burned um, yak butter wax candles. It had a very distinct smell. <laughs> And the room's filled with smoke. And the idea behind these candles burning was the flame flickering on the wick in these candles was a prayer. It was a, it was a mechanical means of offering something to the deities. And all you had to do was, was light that candle and, and the flame's movement would be doing the constant intercession on your behalf. And they had these prayer wheels and it was, a, you know, all these symbols written on a wheel on spindles, and they were aligned vertically, and you would, you would spin the wheel. It sounds like Wheel of Fortune. That one was vertical like this. This one was spinning it sideways like that. And, and with the mo a motion of the wheel, prayers were going up to the deities. And you had this wall just lined with wheels, and you would walk along the wall, and you would just spin them all. And it's this mechanical, ceremonial empty, insincere, vacuous motion of religion that was earning merit for the Tibetan Buddhists. If you've ever climbed Mount Everest, I don't think any of us have done that. You shouldn't. But, but as you climb the Himalayas or if you've seen movies about it or read books about it, you, you, up, in the, up in the wind and high up in the Himalayas, you have these, these monuments and these rock pillars and then all of these uh, streamers and banners and flags. Those are prayer flags. Those are Tibetan Buddhist prayer flags. And the wind whipping those banners through the wind, that motion again is a prayer. And so the guy that, that put the flag up there 
is getting credit for the flag every time it waves. That's one more bit of credit you need to, to make it to the next level in, in Buddhist theology. I would tell you there's not much difference in the mechanical medieval Catholic theology than in the Tibetan Buddhist theology. That you do a thing, that you light a candle, that you do a ceremony, that, that you ask somebody else to do these prayers. All of it is just this religious, ceremonial, empty, mechanical thing rather than the sincerity of heart in faith towards God through Christ. It's like, I need this stuff beside what Christ did to do as a channel of grace. It's not really grace. As a channel of God giving me what I owe if I do enough of these things that are meritorious. The whole system is a, is a system of human effort. Right? Last week we talked about there are only two religions in the world. Human achievement or divine accomplishment. Either God does the work of saving sinners or man is left to do the best he can. And all the religions of the world boil down into that second category of human achievement. Whatever flavor they take, whatever mechanisms they have, it is still man meriting a place before God. Added to Christ is the scapular. The scapular. Not the scapula, that's the you know, bones on the back there. But the scapular was an article of clothing. And it took a number of different forms, usually something like a, a sleeveless robe, an opening for, for the neck and head, and there was a front and a back and kind of some flaps. Uh, that is sort of the clerical scapular, and it had different colors depending on which order of, of monk you belonged to. And then there was the, the common scapular for the regular folk um, that could be worn under your clothes or over your clothes, just kind of a, a couple of braided ropes with little tassel things hanging down on the front and the back. It was like a miniature version of the big kind of robe garb thing. And the scapular was worn as a vehicle for grace and a protection against final judgment. Listen to this. Um, the blessed Claude de la Colombière said, I wanted to know if Mary really and truly interested herself in me. And in the scapular, she has given me the most tangible assurance. I have only to open my eyes. She has attached her protection to the scapular. Quote, whoever dies clothed in this shall not suffer eternal fire. Sermon preach. Now, we're combining the, 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 the work of Mary here with the article of clothing. But the idea was, Mary told this guy that if you just wear this, you escape final judgment. And so, all the monkish orders started to demand, you have to wear it. You can take it off for special occasions. Some said, no, you can't ever take it off. You must sleep in it, do everything in it. Because if your heart stops when you're not wearing it, you don't have assurance. What a travesty. Well, we don't like that Protestant doctrine of assurance of salvation, trusting fully in Christ. We got this robe thing. I mean, it, it, it's, it's the worst of deception and superstition and all the way back to the Garden of Eden. What did Adam and Eve do? Fig leaves. To, to try to cover their sin and their shame. And God's solution was very different than that, an innocent substitute sacrifice in their place. He had to pay something they couldn't. And their human achievements just look silly in the face of God's grace. But it's worse than silly. We move to indulgences. Indulgences, maybe... Um, Something like what, what Martin Luther did in the Lateran Steps at the, the church at Rome, uh, climbing up every single step. Uh, the idea was, I have sins, and I need to make up for them, and, and the Catholic Church can dictate for me how much sin credit gets made up for by this act of love, or this act of sacrifice, or you want to get really dark and, sick, uh, and cynical by this amount of money put into the coffers of the church. 
Now, that was the issue in Luther's day. You remember, they wanted to to run a building campaign for St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And so Tetzel was the the Pope's legate in Germany, and he's walking around, and he he says, and I, I don't know the German, but the English thing rhymes, when the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And they were going around to the common German people and telling them, listen, your Aunt Matilda, who's suffering in the fires of purgatory, can get out if you just put your money in this box. And it is just the the height of evil. And and the Catholic Church today will, I I read an article from uh, Catholic.com, it's the official sort of Catholic answers. And it was an article entitled, uh, Threading the Fine Line of Indulgences where they wanted to say, yeah, Tetzel was corrupt. Uh, that, that wasn't the right way to go about it. But indulgences are true. <laughs> you, you, the, the Catholic Church does have the keys to the kingdom, and the Pope does have the say on who gets forgiven and who doesn't. And so the church is allowed to declare this much sin credit can be put away by this much donation credit or this much good work credit. So they still believe in the same things even at the monetary level, while they might acknowledge that there have been people sometimes in the past who used them to maybe line their own pockets at times. Here's the definition. A remission before God of the temporal punishment. Temporal punishment can be in this life or in purgatory. A remission before God of the temporal punishment due to sins whose guilt has already been forgiven which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed conditions through the action of the church, which as a minister of redemption dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the satisfaction of Christ and the treasury of the saints. Do you see that? You, you access the merits of Christ and you access the merits of other Christians who have gone before by doing whatever the church tells you to do to wipe away some of the, some of the discredit of your sins. The church says an indulgence is obtained through the church who by virtue of the power of binding and loosing granted her by Christ intervenes in favor of individual Christians and opens for them the treasury of merits of Christ and the saints to obtain from the Father of mercies the remission of temporal punishment due their sins. At the Council of Trent, again, that is the counter-reformation in the 1500s by the Catholic Church. They anathematized Luther's teaching that indulgences weren't meritorious. To anathematize meant to damn forever to hell. So the church that said, we have the keys to the kingdom, we're the gatekeepers, we say who's in and who's out, we say that anybody who denies the doctrine of indulgences is going to hell. It's interesting, if you read Luther's 95 Theses, it's a fascinating read. I'm not sure that Luther was a believer at the time that he wrote them, but he was seeing the, the inconsistencies of some of the doctrines of the Catholic Church. He was spying out the corruptions, and he actually was appealing to the Pope in the Theses. If you read them, you're going, wait a second, does he still think the Pope is his pastor? Well, yes, at the time he wrote them. And he's saying, if only the Pope knew the way the indulgences are being corrupted here in Germany, Uh, he would throw a fit. It would all be over. And so even even in in Luther's stating of his 95 theses, he's still committed to the system. In fact, it was many years that Martin Luther was still in the Catholic Church hoping to reform it even after he believed the gospel. Added to Christ as well as the sacramental system. You have in Catholic doctrine the seven sacraments, Baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, that is the Lord's table, penance, final unction, holy orders, and marriage. And these seven sacraments, a sacrament is is designed to be a conveyor of God's grace. That which, again, bumps down your demerits and brings to you the merits of Christ or the merits of saints gone by. 
And the Catholic Church says this in in defense of the sacramental system. Many non-Catholics particularly shy away from the sacramental aspects of Catholicism and not from the seven sacraments only. What they dislike is the mixing of spirit and matter, the gift of something spiritual, grace, by means of physical things. That is, after all, what sacraments are. In the sacraments, common material things such as water, wine, bread, oil, the imposition of hands, results in the giving of grace. And related to the sacraments are the sacramentals, objects such as metals, blessed palms, holy water, and ashes. Their use can lead people to receive grace. In the medieval period was as well the proliferation of relics. Relics. These are um, sort of archaeological finds that had some value. And and we would look at things like this as as having some historical value. Uh, See, we we, we know that that these biblical events were real because we found some coins with the stamp of the historical figures. But in the Catholic Church, the archaeological relics became objects of, and they, they would use the word veneration, you, you, you don't worship, that would be idolatry, but you go and you venerate them. Uh, you give them high honor and, and reverence. And, and you know the slippery slope here? It, it, it's not very long until, for instance, you, you go to modern day Jerusalem and you see all of the Catholic cathedrals and the bits and pieces of historical relics and sites that people down, down, bow down and worship and kiss. Fascinating in the COVID era to see so many people publicly kissing the same item. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people in a long line. And this has gone way past the the idea of historical interest. Uh, This is a conveyor of grace. In fact, in Calvin's day, the, the, the churches in his day had these relics on what they called altars. And they had them in places of worship. And they would charge money for people to come and to touch the relic, to view the relic, in order to receive grace from the relic. And churches of various locations promised different dispensations of grace, different credits for visiting their relic. And of course, you had to pay to get in. So you pay so much money, you get to see this relic, and you get so much credit towards your temporal punishment or somebody else's temporal punishment. And so the the parade from relic to relic to relic in the Catholic cathedrals of Europe was a a regular business. It was a trade. It was a a tourism, all under the guise of religious ceremony. And Calvin wrote a a famous little uh, small book called A Treatise on Relics. I'll just give you a few quotes here. He says, in this town, Geneva, there was formerly an arm of St. Anthony, It was kissed and worshipped as long as it remained in the shrine. But when it was turned out and examined, it was found to be the bone of a stag. There was on the high altar the brain of St. Peter, and so long as it rested in that shrine, nobody ever doubted its genuineness, for it would have been blasphemy to do so. But when it was subjected to close inspection, it proved to be a piece of pumice stone. And this is a really entertaining read. It's uh, Calvin at his most sarcastic I'll spare, you, I'll spare you some of it, not all of it. He described the, the, the amounts of blood of Christ that were in cathedrals throughout Europe. Of course, uh, all, all the Catholic cathedrals believed that the wine was turned miraculously into the blood of Christ, but he meant there were holding tanks of the natural, actual blood of Christ still in liquid form in cathedrals all throughout Europe. He says, it's exhibited in more than 100 places. They show at Rochelle a few drops of it, which as they say was collected by Nicodemus in his glove. In some places they have vials full of it at Mantua and elsewhere. In other parts they have cups filled with it, as in the church of St. Eustache at Rome. And they did not rest satisfied with simple blood. It was considered necessary to have it mixed with water as it flowed out of his side when pierced at the cross. This is preserved in the church of St. John of the Lateran at Rome. And he goes on and on to describe how much blood of Jesus there is throughout Europe. 
He said, in St. Paul's church, there are preserved the swaddling clothes in which he was wrapped, although there are pieces of these clothes elsewhere in Salvatierra in Spain. His cradle is at Rome, as well as the shirt his mother made for him. He describes uh, one church having the water pots in which Jesus changed the water into wine. At Orleans, they even have the wine that was obtained by that miracle. And once a year, the priests there give those who bring offerings a small spoonful, saying that they shall taste of the wine made by, the, by our very Lord at the marriage feast, and its quantity never decreases. Calvin says, there is the cup in which Christ gave the sacrament of his blood to the apostles. That's at Notre Dame uh, de Lille, near Lyon. And there is another in a convent of Augustine uh, in, in Al. Albigeois. Which one's the true one? Uh, Charles Sigonius, a celebrated historian of our time, says in his fourth book on Italy that Baldwin, second king of Jerusalem, captured in 1101, with the assistance of the Genoese, the town of Caesarea in Syria, amongst the spoils taken by his allies was a vessel of emerald, which was considered to have been made use by Jesus at the Last Supper. Therefore, the cup is at Genoa. And he describes numbers of these chalices. in describing the nails from the cross of Christ. He says there's one nail at the church at St. Helena in Rome, another at the Holy Cross of the same city. There's a nail at Siena, another at Venice. Germany has two at, Cl at Cologne and Treves. France, in France there's one at the Holy Chapel at Paris. Uh, another in Paris at the Church of the Carmelites, a third at St. Denis, a fourth at Bruges, a fifth at the Abbey of Tenay in Saint-Ange, uh, a sixth at some other town I won't try to pronounce, and a whole number making 14 nails shown in different towns in different countries. He tallies up all the bits and pieces of the true cross of Christ enough to make dozens of crosses. And this just goes on and on and on. I think one humorous one is there are three bodies of Lazarus in France in cathedrals. What was the point of of all of these relics, it again was another place to convey grace of merit by visiting the place, paying the fees, and touching the relic. There is, of course, the, the blasphemous doctrine of Mary as co-mediatrix and co-redemptrix. Uh, this view was popularized in, in the 20th century by Pope John Paul II, although it was held for many, many centuries prior. And the idea here is that Mary suffered too, just as any mother would suffer when her son was suffering. And so the, the suffering of Mary is vicarious. In Catholic doctrine, the, the idea of the immaculate con conception we might think, well, yeah, the, the conception of Jesus in Mary's womb was immaculate. What's wrong with that? By immaculate conception, Catholics mean Mary was conceived without sin. And then the assumption of Mary is that she didn't die. Uh, the other Catholic doctrine is that she remained a virgin all her life. Well, all of this goes against the New Testament. Mary herself proclaimed, I need a Savior. <laughs> and his name is Jesus. And now the, the whole idea of Mary is elevated to the level of co-mediatrix. She mediates for sinners to God. You know, if you're a Protestant, you think Hail Mary is just a football play. A last-ditch effort in a vain hope against hope to win the game. The Hail Mary prayer, Hail Mary full of grace. What are they saying? They're asking Mary to mediate. And they do that because the God, uh, God the Father, like the God of the Old Testament, is just this angry, vindictive God, and you just don't know what He's going to do. But thankfully, we have Jesus who intercedes with His Father, who, who is just unpredictable. But thankfully, also, we have Mary to intercede for us because her Son will always do what she says. <laughs> That is a vile doctrine. And not only does it, does it, would it offend Mary herself at infinite proportion, but it, but it replaces Christ alone with Christ plus a sinner to mediate between sinners and a holy God. And, you know, in, in Latin culture around here, the, 
the, the Mariolatry is real. Just up the street, you know, the Guadalupe, the, the town here is, is named after the superstition relating to an appearance of Mary, Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, there to console sinners by her mediating presence and her grace. It's all over our culture. Here's the word from the Second Vatican Council. The motherhood of Mary in the order of grace continues uninterruptedly from the consent which she loyally gave at the Annunciation and which she sustained without wavering beneath the cross until the eternal fulfillment of all the elect. Taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside this saving office, but by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. By her maternal charity, she cares for the brethren of her son who still journey on earth surrounded by dangers and difficulties until they are led into their blessed home. This comes from the dogmatic constitution of the church. She is called Savior, the giver of the gift of salvation. One other addition to the work of Christ is simply the doctrine of purgatory. If Mary's work for you and your good works and the treasury of the saints and all the ceremonies and the lighting of candles and all the masses isn't enough to make up for the dirty deeds you've done, and of course none of that would be, but even in the Catholic scheme of things, if you haven't done enough to make up, well, it's not over yet. You have the doctrine of purgatory. It comes from the word to purge, and the idea is you spend time in physical punishment, in torment. It's not the lake of fire. It's not hell. It's not the forever after the great white throne judgment. It is a temporary place of punishment until your punishment is complete. And when your punishment is complete, you get out. Never mind the eschatological chronology of the New Testament, which would disallow the time scale that the Catholic Church promotes. In fact, Luther was talking about how many hundreds of thousands of years Catholics in his day were said to have accrued in purgatory. (laughs) Just put your money in the box. You'll take off some of those years. The the biblical chronology doesn't allow for that kind of time. But, but never mind that, the idea that God would give you punishment for hundreds of thousands of years to pay for the sins that ostensibly Jesus already paid for is a problem of justice. And it promotes hopelessness. This is why a Catholic can't have assurance And this is why this pernicious lie of Satan under the banner of Christendom is so wicked. Think about what happens when a Catholic dies. I'm going to get, okay, give me the the final orders. Give Give me the last rites. Give me the prayers. Give me the holy oil. I hope I've done everything right. Give me give me communion at the last second on the battlefield as I'm bleeding out. And then, okay, at least I've got purgatory to look forward to. And what a tragedy when people who have not believed Christ but believed all of these human inventions instead of Christ sit under temporary judgment. Oh, the Bible's clear. There is temporary judgment. It's called Hades. It is the place of the departed spirits of the wicked who who are not absent from the body present with the Lord better by far. No, they are, as, as Jesus described in Luke 16, in agony in flame. And one day Hades will be emptied and all the wicked dead there will be presented before Jesus at the great white throne in Revelation 20 and have all of their deeds read. They've not been purged. And what a, what a wicked, pernicious deception from Satan that someone in Hades now has hope that I'll get out. And you think about the effects of that lie at the resurrection when they get a new body fit for eternal existence to go with their soul only to show up at final judgment having learned only then my sins weren't forgiven. My grandchildren praying for me and giving money to to St. Peter's did nothing for me. None of my sins have been paid for. It's a... Tragic lie. Are you weary of this? 55 minutes of Christ plus? 
Can we just talk about Christ alone for a second? Here's a survey of the book of Ephesians. In Christ, we were chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. In Christ, we have redemption through his blood. In Christ, we have forgiveness of trespasses according to grace. In Christ, we understand God's kind intention toward us. In Christ is the summing up of all things. In Christ, we were made God's inheritance. In Christ, we have hope. In Christ, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. In Christ, God employed the surpassing greatness of his power toward us. In Christ, we have been made alive. With Christ, we are raised up. With Christ, we are seated in the heavenly places. In Christ, we have, we have become eternal beneficiaries of the riches of God's grace toward us. In Christ, we are God's workmanship. In Christ, we are brought near to God by His blood. In Christ, we are reconciled to God and to others. In Christ, we have access to the Father. In Christ, the church is fitted together and grows. In Christ, we are partakers of the promise of the gospel. In Christ, God's eternal purpose is carried out. In Christ, we have bold access through faith. In Christ, we are to mature. We learned Christ, Ephesians 4.20, in our entrance into the gospel. Truth is in Christ. We belong to Christ. In Ephesians 6.10, we are to be strong in Christ. By the way, according to the book of Ephesians, if you are not in Christ, where are you? You are dead in transgressions and sins. Fast forward 500 years plus. What does the modern churches need for solus Christus? Well, much of the world is still under Christendom, maybe a billion people. And the Catholic Church hasn't changed. So our witness to Catholics still is grounded in the same things it was grounded in for Luther and Calvin and the Reformers. But, but maybe outside of, of that realm, we, we would uphold Christ alone as opposed to all other competitors, be they Catholic competitors or any other kinds of additions or replacements. John 14, 6, Jesus made it clear his claim is universal and exclusive. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life, and no one gets to the Father except through him. That matters for our faith, it matters for our evangelism, and think about as a, as a Protestant, as a believer in the gospel, how easy it can be to slip into a doctrine of penance. Now, that was one of those seven sacraments I mentioned. We didn't describe it, but penance is the idea that you uh, make up for what you just did bad. If you ever saw the movie The Mission, uh, there, there was a, a Catholic guy who had been a murderer. Uh, he comes to the Catholic faith, and in order to pay down his crimes, he puts this huge burden on his shoulder, and he climbs up a waterfall. <laughs> and he's just trying to make up for his sins with some mechanical thing. It, it's so easy for us, I think, in our flesh to replace repentance with Catholic penance. I, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Husbands, um, you, you have a, a difficult conversation, you, you say unkind things to your wife, and um, what you should be doing is before the Lord repenting and, and with your wife confessing your sins, um, replacing those sins with, with the things you should be doing instead by the power of God. But you know what, I, I don't wanna address any of that. That's, that's, that's kinda hard. What if I just do the dishes? Then she'll like me again. That's penance. That's not repentance. And we can do the same thing vertically. Boy, I, I blew it again with God. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read my Bible more. Well, you should read your Bible more, <laughs> but not as a one-for-one -one replacement for sins committed. The only one-for-one -one replacement for sins committed is faith again in the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. Now, that produces godly sorrow and godly repentance. Listen, we, we can have gospel presentations that neglect substitutionary atonement. If you leave out the Christ alone part of the gospel, you don't have the gospel at all. We can present the gospel in such a way that, that what we do drowns out the merits of Christ. Listen, it has to be crystal clear that our justification is solely, only on the basis of Christ's work. That is the only basis for a sinner to be made right with a holy God. 
We, we run into the, the prohibition against getting glory or boasting when we have a gospel other than Christ alone. Let me give you one last modern implication for us for the doctrine of Christ alone, and it has to do with our comfort. Christian, you, you're gonna sin, and you need comfort, and your comfort cannot come from a sacrament. It cannot come from someone else's merit. It cannot come from anything you could do to make up. Listen to the words of Octavius Winslow in his book, The Sympathy of Christ. He says, Christ was suffering as the sin-bearing, sin-atoning substitute for his church. For this, the waters were rushing into his soul. He was sinking in deep mire where there was no standing, into deep waters where the floods overflowed him. He was now by imputation bearing the exceeding sinfulness and malignity of sin, the bitter burning nature of divine wrath on its account, the assaults of the power of darkness, added to which was the withdrawment of all divine, sensible, and spiritual light and comfort for his soul. Beloved, behold your salvation. Your sins were on that sinless one. Your sorrow was sinking that holy soul. All this darkness and desertion was for you. He loved you, and he gave himself up for you. The simple, full belief of this will lift your soul above all sorrow and distress and alarm for sin. The divine Redeemer's soul bore all, absolved all, and exhausted all penal grief in the place and stead of his people. The punishment was his because by suretyship and transfer, the sin was his. He took our sins. He made himself answerable to divine justice on their account. Our sins being found upon him by imputation, when justice paused at the cross, she exacted from him the full equivalent, inflicted upon him the full penalty, Surely a divine and sinless Redeemer could only have met this demand. The sorrow then was His, the joy ours. Sin-distressed soul, look at the distress of Christ's soul and be joyful. Never shall your soul be as His, sorrowful unto death. Yours is a sorrow unto life. The burden of sin you now feel shall be as wings to your soul, bearing it to Jesus. The grief for your sin you now experience shall be the occasion of your deepest, holiest joy. There is everlasting, there is everything in a soul sorrowing Christ to impress with joy, gladness, and hope the soul sorrowing sinner. The deep, fathomless grief, grief of his holy soul utterly forbids the existence of despair on account of sin in the heart of a truly awakened, sensible sinner. After such sorrow as the Savior experienced, the chief of sinners, stricken with godly penitence, may hope. Remembering his soul travail, the sorrow unto death, think that when you, by one touch of his hand, one word of his mouth, one glance of his eye, he can heal, assure, and save you. That he will repel your approach, reject your plea, and refuse to pardon and accept you? Oh no! Before you arrive at such a conclusion, you must ignore his sacrifice and regard the story of his dying agonies, his soul grief, his blood shedding on the cross as fiction, a fable, a myth. It is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. We close with an anonymous poem. I sing my Savior's wondrous death. He conquered when he fell. Tis finished, said his dying breath, and shook the gates of hell. Lord Jesus, we give you all glory for inaugurating, authoring, processing, and finishing the work of our salvation. When those soldiers came to arrest you in the garden, you merely said, I am, and they fell back. None could conquer you. None could take away what you have finished. None could take out of your loving hands any of your precious ones for whom you bled, for whom you bled. We trust fully and completely and solely in your finished sacrifice. To you be the glory. Amen.